Good morning, church. Hey, let's stand to our feet as we go to worship this morning. We'll open in prayer. Uh, it's great to see you guys. I'm glad you're here. If it's your first time here, thanks for coming. Uh, Father God, thank you for today. Thank you that uh, we can worship you um, in freedom, Lord. I pray that today this service is yours and you have your way, Lord. I pray that anything that happens is for your purpose, Lord, and you work all things out for your glory, Lord. We love you. We thank you. We just ask that in Jesus' name. Amen.
Children, you are dismissed to your classes. A couple announcements for you, church. Remember, if you signed up for the Great Lakes Loons Faith and Family Night, that's Friday, July 22nd at 7.05. Um, for all current and potential children ministry helpers, there's going to be a meeting August 1st at 7 p.m. So if you are presently working in the children's ministry or you want to work in the children's ministry, this meeting would be for you. And men, there's a men's breakfast August 20th at 8 o'clock. That's going to be out here in the foyer. There's a sign-up sheet back there in the back so we know how many people to prepare for. Make sure you get signed up for that. It's going to be a good time of, of reflection, of praying, of, of lifting one another up. It's just something that you're going to want to be a part of. And then Sunday, August 21st at 6 p.m., the homemade ice cream awards are going to be given out. You've already heard all pastors boasting how he's got the best ice cream and nobody's going to beat him and he's thrown the gauntlet down to everybody else. So make sure you make up your homemade ice cream and bring it out here just to, just to show pastor or if you want to have sympathy for him and let him win, you can do that as well. As we prepare to go to the Lord in prayer, we want to remember our sister congregation right here beside us, the Methodist Church. We want to be able to lift them up in prayer. We want to continue to lift up our elders, our Sunday school teachers, our youth leaders, our ministry leadership. Just ask that God would surround them with his presence. We want to lift up the Grace Harbor Church of God in Kalamazoo. Continue to pray for them, for their ministry, for their families. And we want to pray this week, this entire week, be lifting up Mike and Linda White to just continue to, to cover them in prayer and ask that God would bless them and direct them and encourage them this week. Let's pray together. Gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this privilege. We've come together here where we can worship you. We can, we can praise you together with our brothers and sisters in Christ. We can come into this place and we can feel your presence. We can feel the love of Christ. We can see it in those that are around us. And it's a privilege that we have, and we thank you for that. We ask that you be with these many requests, Lord, with these, with these churches that we've mentioned off today, that you would just lay your hand upon their pastors, upon their leadership, that, that you would give them direction and guidance, that they would feel your presence, allowing them to make the next steps, allowing them to, to lead their congregations, lead these children in the changing times that are going on around us. We ask that you bless Mike and Linda White, that you, would, that you would encourage them, that they would feel the prayers of this congregation, that they would just feel your presence this week like never before, Lord, that they would just, just have a longing and desire to want to be closer to you because of what they're feeling in the prayers that are going up. We ask that you continue to be with us in this service, Lord, that you would just overwhelm us with your presence, that, that you would just stop all the things that are going on in our mind and our heart and allow us to listen to your spirit this morning. Allow us to fellowship, allow us to praise from deep down inside for the many blessings that you've given to us. 
We ask that you bless our pastor. Allow him to speak with the authority that you've given to him, with the message that you've laid upon his heart, especially for us. Deliver it to us this morning, Lord. In your precious heavenly name, we pray and praise. Amen.
chase down my heart through all of my failure and pride. On a hill you created, the light of the world, abandoned in darkness to Explain so much of your depth and your love and your goodness. Father, thank you for this chance that we can be here today to worship you. We do not take life for granted. We don't take it for granted that we wake up every morning that is indeed a gift from you. And so bless us now in this time as we focus our minds and our hearts on you, the God of creation, the one who loved us so much. In your name we pray. Amen. Hey, it's great to have you here. During the summer, uh, the summers are kind of light uh, for a lot of people, a lot of churches. I talk to pastors and they go, man, the attendance is down so much. I go, yeah, it's summertime, but just look when school starts. Find that date, everybody will be back. Kids are in school. So I'm glad you're here. Uh, thank you for the band. Uh, for Mike leading, uh, a lot of them are gone. They're camping. They're on vacation. A lot of people are gone uh, this week, but I'm glad you're here. My sister's here from Oklahoma, and uh, so I was glad I got to spend a few days with her. She's already retired, and uh, she's younger than me, and she's already retired. I'm not sure how that worked in the equation there, but anyway, good to have her here. I ask her. <laughs> I'd naturally ask her, so what's retirement like? She said it is absolutely Wonderful. So, I thought you guys might go, that's right, it is. A lot of you are retired in here. Anyway, you all awake? <laughs> well, Jesus 
has been preaching in Judea. You have seen that over the last eight weeks in this, this series called Binge Jesus. And what we're really trying to do, what I'm trying to do is attempt for every one of us to see that Jesus may be a whole lot more than what we think. And I hope that in these last couple of months, you've been able to see that, that maybe the Jesus you've heard about and have known all these years, he's really more than what you thought, that he really wants to have this intimate walk in our lives, that he was a person that laughed, that cried, maybe told a joke, had a great time in life, danced at a wedding, person that loved to be with people. I hope you've been able to see that. We only have this week and next week in this series before we move on. And I've really enjoyed it because even for myself, I've, I realized that, that God, he was, he was fully divine and yet he was fully human. And he experienced what we experienced, the good times and the rough times. So Jesus, he's been preaching in Judea. His ministry is proving to be even more effective than John the Baptist. The religious authorities have become somewhat disturbed at the number of converts that the disciples of Jesus were baptizing. And it is in these circumstances that our Lord decides to go back to Galilee. And to get there, he has to travel through Samaria. Now the jealousy of the Pharisees may at first sight appear to have been the motive for Jesus to leave, but let me assure you it wasn't. Jesus was no coward. You see, there was a much deeper reason for where he was go going. We all know that God has these attributes. He's omnipresence. He's everywhere. He's, he's omnipotent. He's all-powerful. But he's also omniscient. He's all-knowing. He's all-knowing. He knows all things. And he had something planned out that would appear to most of us as we read it in the scriptures was just this chance encounter with a person in Samaria. But in Romans 8, 28, it says, God works all things together for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. So here is Jesus passing near a city called Sychar. Jesus grew tired and he's thirsty. So he's resting in a field. He has gone to a well. There's a well there in this field. And it was a, a well that had be, belonged to Jacob many centuries before. And it was here that Jacob, after he returned from a self-imposed exile of more than 20 years, that he builds an altar to the one true living God. It was here that Joshua had buried the bones of Jacob's son, Joseph, after the nation of Israel returned from captivity in Egypt. Jesus' disciples are not with him. Perhaps he had sent them away to go get food at a nearby town. Maybe perhaps Jesus sent them away because he knew he wanted to be alone. For it was on this day that Jesus has an appointment with someone. Someone who's Life is about to be changed by their meeting. A life that would be completely transformed.
Would you give me a drink? Did you hear me? That's bad, huh? What? You, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a Samaritan, and a woman. I'm sorry. I should have said please. <laughs> you know, it's not safe for you to be alone out here. Nor you. Why haven't you come with others? Why so late in the day? Don't women come to the wells in the, the cool of the morning? Yeah, well, none of them will be seen with me. The story of the woman at the well. It follows in John 4 on the heels of the account of Jesus' interaction with Nicodemus, who we looked at last week, a prominent member of the Jewish Sanhedrin. She has come to draw water about a mile on the outskirts of the city of Sychar in Samaria. What you have just seen is recorded in John chapter 4. I want us to go a little bit deeper with this story so we can really know why this is even written in the Gospels. She is an extraordinary woman. She is a Samaritan, a race of people that the Jews utterly despised as having no claim on their God. But she is also an outcast. She is looked down upon by her own people. Why is she looked down upon with, with such scorn? The answer is found in the fact that she comes alone to draw water from the community well. It was customary during biblical times to come and to take water from the well in the morning during the cool of the day to chat and to visit at the well with those people who were there. This was the social high point of a woman's day, a time to be out from under the thumb of a male-dominated society. They're, they came for companionship, for friendship, to laugh and to share. But this luxury, this luxury would not be afforded for this woman. No, no, she had been ostracized, shunned, marked as immoral. She is an unmarried woman living openly with the sixth in a series of men, and so she comes alone to escape the stares, the sly remarks of the more respected members of her community. She comes walking in the heat of the day to draw water. But it is also on this day that another has come to the well. He is also weary from travel, and so he stops at Jacob's well to rest. But this day, this lone woman will have a one-on-one -on -one encounter with our Lord Jesus Christ. It will be an appointment that will change her life, but not only her life, but her community as well. The woman arrives at her destination carrying her water pots, unaware that she is about to have a divine appointment with God himself. You see, the one who is sitting there before she arrives knows. Yes, he knows that she will be there. And why is he there? Because he is waiting for her. You see, my friends, it doesn't matter if everybody's not here that comes to this church. Jesus is here for you. And I can look around here, and, and I've been here almost 15 years. I know where people sit. I know who sits in the second row. They're gone. It doesn't matter. Jesus is here for you, and we see this in this story. Jesus went there to meet her. You'll notice in John 4, verse 4, that it says, Now he had to go through Samaria. He had to go through Samaria. Why? Why did he have to? Why did he have to go through that particular part of the region? He could have went another way. I believe 
in my simple faith in Jesus' love that she is the reason he went there to see her. He came for her just as he comes for you and I. You see, she comes to the well and she is weary and tired also. But her weariness comes not only from carrying the water jar from such a distance day in and day out in the middle of the day. No, no, it is from the emptiness and loneliness that she carries into her heart. That's why she is so tired and weary. A life that is now empty and depleted from years spent in wild and reckless living. Her life of passion, which she has served, has now run its course. She is weathered and beaten down, appearing older than she actually is. She comes to the well, perhaps thinking of how her life has turned out. Perhaps she thinks, what if? What if I made different decisions concerning my life? Where would I be? What could my life have looked like had I had made wiser choices? The opportunities that could have been there, the happiness that she might have found if she would have decided to go another course, another direction, instead of the one she chose. But now it's too late. Her life has become a dead end. Living with a man in a relationship that is absolutely going nowhere. It's really nothing more than convenience, so she is not out living on the street. She has gone from man to man, and her marriage has become nothing of what she had hoped or longed for. She had thought of love and happiness, as we all do when we get married. And yet, she has been disappointed time and time again. And so she comes on this day, just another day to a well carrying an empty water jar that really is nothing more than a symbol of her empty life. Jesus says to the woman, give me a drink, and the interaction begins. By his appearance, the woman can, woman can tell that this stranger is not one of her race, the Samaritan. So imagine her surprise when he suddenly speaks to her. After all, the Jews are not to have any dealings with their neighbors in Samaria, nor men communicating with women. The woman says to Jesus, how is it you who ask me? And Jesus says, as you saw in the video, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. You and I know that it is Jesus Christ who will give living water which will cause one to never thirst again. Water which will become in a person a spring of water swelling up to eternal life. So this woman asks and says to Jesus, Sir, give me this water so I won't be thirsty. And it, it, it is here that Jesus really begins to draw her in. He says, go, call your husband and come back. But it's what he doesn't say that commands her attention. For he only speaks briefly of her past and of her marital status. He, he makes no mention of her sin. He gives no call for her to repent. He doesn't give her a plan of salvation. He gives her no prayer. He only gives her a reflection of herself. And it is then that she realizes that she is speaking with one who knows all about her, about her past, her present, her failures. She addresses him as sir again and speaks of religious things to him, about the Messiah that will come. They speak about the subject of worship, that the one true God is worshiped in spirit and in truth. She responds at the end by saying, I know that Messiah, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming, and when he comes, he will explain everything to us. But he says to her as their conversation comes to a close, I am who speaks to you. 
I who speak to you am he. He is the one who has come to bring her a most incredible gift that day, living water, a gift that she can receive in that moment, a gift that she cannot earn or work for, but it is free for the taking. To this woman who has come to this well and has met a stranger who is a Jew, who she calls sir, who she even acknowledges as a prophet. And as the truth of the encounter begins to unfold between them, she realizes that he is her Messiah, the one that she has waited for for so long. Friends, it's so interesting to me that in the excitement of discovering who the Lord is, this woman forgets why she has come to the well. In her excitement, she leaves her water pot. She races back to the city with her exciting news. She runs to tell, to share with those in the town, those who have shunned her, those who have talked about her, those who have ridiculed her. She leaves her water jars behind, realizing that a whole new life is now in front of her a life overflowing with living water, and she goes to town to proclaim the good news to people of that city who hate her. Think about that. But she has good news she wants to share with them all. Well, the Samaritans hear what the woman has to say about Jesus, but they wanted to encounter him for themselves. That's where the video stopped. I can kind of imagine looking up from the well. Could it be, yes, that Jesus and the disciples were in for a rare sight? As she went down over the hill, and several minutes later, many who began to come toward them. And all of a sudden, the disciples and Jesus see this sea of white turbans coming toward them. And Jesus says, lift up your eyes. See how the fields are already white for harvest. It's right there. It's right there in John 4, the next paragraph. Jesus telling his disciples, look, the fields are white with harvest, but the laborers are few. They're here. This is what I've come for. The Samaritans asked Jesus to stay, and for two days he remained, teaching them the way of salvation in which many, many more became believers. My friends, you and I also must not merely be satisfied with the testimony of others. We must test out these things for ourselves, for it is then that we will discover that indeed Jesus is in the Savior of the world. And so these people, they heard this woman, they believed, but they wanted to see for themselves, so they came. And as we come to Christ and experience him for ourselves, it is then that we will be able to worship him in spirit and in truth, just as he promised this woman at the well. So, 2,000 years later, July 17th, 2022. On that day, Jesus sat at the well 2,000 years ago, but may I propose to you today that he is sitting among us right now. Dale, Jesus is sitting right next to you. Brett? came to the back row, kind of scooted Ethan over, and sat down between you. Oh, man. Oh, goodness. He is sitting among us this morning. You see, I believe that he is here, and he is here to tell us, just as he told this woman, that God loves you. God knows who you are, in spite of the fact that your life may feel like it is an empty water vessel. He still loves you, 
And this morning, God values you and I enough to actively seek us out as he did this woman, to come to us and seek us. Let me remind you again of verse 4 that said he had to go through Samaria, so he came to a town called Sychar. Why did he choose that route? Once again, I believe he came all the way to Samaria for her, and he will go all the way to where you are just to get you. That's how much Christ loves us, every one of us. I mean, I've heard that scripture my whole life. Wherever two or three of you are gathered together, he is there in the midst of you. When you watch that video, there's only two of them. One's Jesus and one's the woman. He doesn't need anybody else. Shuffled the disciples off to go do another job. Jesus had an appointment. I believe, and I hope that we all understand that Jesus reaches out to each one of us individually because he wants you to be a part of his plan. And this is where I think so many people miss what this story is all about. He wants you to be a part of his plan. As Jesus meets with this Samaritan woman, this outcast from her own people, this lone woman who appears to have very little value to anyone, who really only longs to be truly wanted. It is Jesus who offers unto her only what he can give. Everyone who drinks this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks the water that I will give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water walling up into eternal life. She may have been a Samaritan, but on that day, Jesus set the record straight that all people, all people are valuable to God and that Jesus desires that we all demonstrate his love to every person we come into contact with, including our enemies, those people who want nothing to do with God. Now let us understand what the true purpose of this story is all about, and you are all included in here. You see, the story is all about evangelism. That's what I saw. That's what it's all about. Each one of us has a story to tell, just as this woman did. She went back to her community and told every one of them about Jesus. And we need to be able to tell that same story about our life, about who we were before we met Christ, who we were when we came to Christ and what happened, and what's happened since in our life, in knowing him. Many of the Samaritans from that town believe in him because of this woman's testimony. Who are we testifying to about Christ? He told me everything I ever did. Well, that probably got their attention. Perhaps today you are here and you have come, but maybe something is different today for you. Perhaps you've heard from the Savior this morning. Perhaps you know today that salvation comes only to those who recognize their desperate need for the spiritual life that they do not have. This living water that Jesus is talking about. It can be every one of ours today. If you're spiritually dry and thirsty, maybe you've come this morning looking, seeking desperately to change your life from where you are that can take place today. Salvation comes only to those who take hold of the absolute truth that Jesus is indeed the Messiah. I happen to believe that this country, this nation, this world is where it is today because it has rejected the Christ. We have looked at our own direction that we want to go. This is what I want. This is what I'm going to do. And we do it. And we leave Jesus in the dust. And yet, my friends, the truth is 
that salvation, I don't care who you belong to, who you've tied your carriage up to, I don't care what you believe in, salvation is found in no one else. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. That's it. Sorry. And I've had people tell me, yeah, but what about if I went this? No. Well, what about this crystal hanging in my rearview mirror? Can't you? Can't. No. Well, what about this spirit? No. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Who said that? Jesus. It's nobody else. We must confess and repent of our sin and desire God's forgiveness to know that our debt has been paid. It's already over with. On the cross, all we have to do is acknowledge it and accept it. And so I ask you this morning, are you broken? Are you battered? Are you bruised and scorned much like this woman was? You can do something about that today all because of what Jesus did. You see, he's so much more than, than what I think most of us think he is. It might surprise you to know that the conversation that Jesus had with this woman at the well is the longest conversation in the scriptures that Jesus had with another person. This one woman. Back then during biblical times, Women were like property. They were looked down upon. They were to be used for whatever a man wanted. But for Jesus, remember, I don't, I'm not here to condemn you. I'm here for you. And I hope this story is your story. That you found Jesus, as this woman did, to be so kind, so loving. And that you became one day very much aware that you are on his mind and that he thinks of you often. That he stopped by where you live. That he ha I love this thing I said last week, that he has your picture in his wallet. Your picture is on his refrigerator. That's how much God loves you. You're it to him. That he would be willing to pick up all the pieces of a shattered and bruised and broken heart and make it brand new as he did for her, as he will do for us today. If you've not experienced that, he will give you living water today, this morning, that you will never thirst again. What a God. What a God. Father, we thank you today. That you can mean so much to us if we will just let you. But we hold back. We want to do life on our own. We think we can do it all. We think we have the answers. And we're all guilty of that. We think we can figure this thing called life out. And so we waste the years we get to the end of our life and realize, as Solomon did, it's all just vanity. The only thing that really matters. Solomon, in the last chapter, the only thing that really matters is obeying God and knowing his commandments. Father, may we be a people when maybe when all the rest of the world is going off the cliff, that we remember that God said there will always be a remnant who will come after me. May we be that remnant. May we not allow anyone or anything to deter us, to keep us from you, that we will always seek your face. Father, today these altars are open. For anyone who just wants to come and pray. And I know that you will meet them there just as you met that woman on that hot, hot afternoon and changed her life completely. In your name we pray these things.
Come and pray if you'd like. Our altars are always open.
Let's pray. Gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you again for allowing us to be able to come together here. We thank you as we prepare to leave now to, that we know that the words that we've heard here don't just stay here. They go with us. They're a part of us. They're something that, that we can share in the community around us. We ask, Lord, that you would just make us a light to that community, to, to other people that we come across, that we can share your love with them. We just ask for your blessings and your strength, Lord. In your precious heavenly name, we pray and praise. Amen. And I know I forgot something because Pastor Skunk snuck up on me in the middle of prayer. No, no, you didn't forget anything. I forgot. I would like to meet with all of the men down here uh, just for a moment. It'll just take two minutes. Uh, just meet you uh, just immediately after service. I got to talk to you about something. Okay, thank you. God bless you.